Welcome to the video edition of Spring Forth. Welcome to the Spring Forth Podcast, a ministry of the First Congregational Church of McGregor, Iowa. This recording has been made for April 26th, the third Sunday in the season of Easter. As we journey this day, Lord, we thank you for being our companion and our guide, for you never lead us astray. You renew us. Thank you for this day that you have given us and all the many blessings. Amen. This morning, we're going to do a little walking. We're going to take some steps. We're going to head out on the road with Jesus. He's going to encounter us. We're going to discover something new about ourselves. Time spent with him is never wasted. He calls us to service. He renews our strength and provides us with the ability to bless others. The gospel for this morning comes to us from Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 35. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about the things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place here in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word, before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women from our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who had said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to where they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening, the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them, and while he was at table with them, he took bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? At that same hour, they got up, returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were there saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and has appeared to Simon. And then they told him about what had happened on the road, and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to Christ. Good morning. Welcome to the Spring Forth Podcast Outdoor Edition. We are standing here somewhere 
in the wilderness of Northeast Iowa. So today's text is one about a journey, a foot journey, a journey between two disgruntled, disheartened, disaffected disciples. It seems that we're having a, a reoccurring theme here with disciples who are all bent out of shape because Jesus didn't deliver on the promises that they had hoped he would deliver on. And what were those two disciples so disaffected about? It was evening on that first day, that first Easter Sunday, when the news that Jesus had been risen was starting to circulate amongst the disciples. But these two disciples were on their way walking from Jerusalem to Emmaus, a village about seven miles outside of Jerusalem. They were just walking and talking. Now, while they're walking and talking, Jesus appears right alongside them as a fellow journeyman. They don't recognize him. Their eyes were kept from seeing him. I don't know exactly what that means, but Luke gives us this sense that something mysterious and divine is taking place. Now, Jesus knows exactly what they're talking about. But since they don't know it's Jesus, he can have a little bit of fun with them. So as he just jumps in, crashes into their conversation, he asks them, hey, what are you talking about while you walk along? Now this is where things really heat up because first of all, Jesus was uninvited. So he just crashes in on their conversation along the way and asks them, where are you going and what are you talking about? And Cleopas gives him this look like, okay, first of all, who invited you? We don't know you from anywhere. And second of all, how can you be so uninformed? Don't you know what's been going on? Don't you know what's been happening around here? This place is full with the conversation and the talk about Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth. He was going to be incredible. And we can't believe you don't know anything about him. I can imagine Jesus not trying to have a laugh at these two desperate disciples trying to explain to him the story about himself. But they're weighed down in grief. The last thing that they recall was Jesus being crucified, being placed in the tomb. In fact, they had to get out of Jerusalem because the grief and the weight of their disappointment was so great that they just had to go for a walk, get in the outdoors, change their perspective about things. So here Jesus is listening to them talk about Jesus and how he was going to be magnificent, the savior of the world. And their hopes are dashed because they saw it all result in his death. So as far as they're concerned, well, we backed the wrong horse. And so they're trying to explain this to Jesus, and Jesus must be trying to hold back. A, he can only imagine the look on his face, trying to hold back perhaps maybe a, a, a stifled laugh or, or maybe a smirk as he listens to these two lament about how Jesus missed the mark and didn't quite deliver them the way that they had anticipated. Now, from what we know about Jesus, he is kind and long-suffering and patient. And he's been exceedingly patient with his disciples even before his crucifixion. But now afterwards, now that he needs them to understand the reality of the resurrection, he exhibits an even greater degree of patience with these two particular disciples as they journey along. He can't take it anymore. He cannot listen to his story be hacked up and end at the cross or end at the tomb. He turns to these disciples and he goes all the way back into scripture. He goes back into prophecy and he walks them through, quite literally, the scriptures that speak about the Messiah, 
that speak about the dawning of this new reality, that speak about all these things that have to take place in order for the Messiah to be able to deliver us. These men, these disciples need to hear this testimony from Jesus firsthand, so that way they will realize that this didn't end in a crash and burn. This is the real deal all throughout. And if they could just but pay attention, go back to the scriptures, go back to the source, they would come to understand as Jesus understood that this was all part of the great divine plan. So in this great on the road biblical lesson that Jesus has given them, the disciples reach their destination. They reach the place where they're gonna lodge for the night. And Jesus acts like, like he's going on. And they say, where, where are you going? I mean, he doesn't pretend that he's going to stay with them. And he doesn't let on that he's going someplace else. So they're just like, look, why don't you just stay with us for the night? Because after all, first century Palestine, here we have hospitality is the crown jewel. So they invite him to come in and lodge with them for the night. After all, he's been a good sport. And he seems to be pretty wise in this biblical wisdom. Let's sit down. Let's prepare for the night. It's at this point when Jesus enters in the house, the role reversal takes place. And Jesus goes from being the invited guest to being the host. He takes the bread and he blesses it and he offers it to them. And immediately their eyes are open. They get it. The light bulbs go off over their heads and they realize that was him. That was the man. But he had vanished from their sight. He had vanished from their sight. He was gone. He was to be seen no more that night. But those two disciples, they were fired up. It was as if they were drinking some of those, those energy drinks. They were recharged and renewed. We don't even know if they finished their meal. But what we do know is that they said, were not our hearts burning within us when he was revealing the scriptures to us on the road, when he was opening the scriptures to us, when he was schooling us along the way and telling us, indeed, do not despair, have heart, take heart. I am with you. I'm even closer than you imagine. And it's in the breaking of the bread, in the revealing of the bread. Boom! That's the man. There he is. But now he's gone. So the disciples, those two disciples say, we, we got to go back. I mean, we've walked seven miles already, but I could walk, I could walk another 20 miles if I have to. Because we've got to tell the others that indeed he is risen. So what does all this mean for us? this moment of awareness. These two disciples who had already conceived in their own minds that there was a certain thing that had happened, they had such high hopes, and then they were dashed by his death. Then they meet this mysterious stranger along the way as they're just sort of walking off the blues. This stranger turns out to be the very man upon which they have placed their hopes. We're not so different than those disciples, those individuals who had a set of expectations only to find that their minds were completely turned around and what they had discovered was something far more magnificent than what they had envisioned. We're on a journey as well. And we do not know where this journey will end. What we do know is that we are moving along the best way that we can. And what we hope is that we will discover that this entire time we have been walking with Christ. And in walking with Christ, we find a great stability we discover ourselves anew. We find out that we're not so confused and lost. And all it takes is a little spark, a little spark to reignite within us what we always knew, what was always authentic. And that is God endures in and through us and calls us to a new reality. We're certainly living in a new time. I know that I keep saying that a lot because it's true. It is an unusual time, and it was an unusual time for those disciples as well. Let's talk plainly. Those disciples saw something incredible in Jesus, and this was before he went to the cross. They saw a man who presented himself with incredible confidence, with resolve. He made no distinctions between those who were princes, those who were paupers. He met people where they were at. He blessed them. He spoke to them words of hope truth and renewal. To see Jesus broken on a cross, laid in the tomb, looked very final for these disciples. We can resonate at some point with their surprise, their alarm, the finality of it all. But I love the twists and turns in this particular passage that Jesus is the very one 
whom they were seeking, and they didn't recognize him. They didn't recognize him because they were so weighed down with grief, so burdened upon their set of expectations that when God does this new thing right in front of them, they cannot perceive it. Let us not fall prey to that, to that same trick of being able to stare right in the face of a blessing and not apprehend it. For those of you who know me in the sanctuary, you know I do a lot of movement back and forth and back and forth. So today I have decided to just sort of go out on a walk in honor of the Emmaus text to take to my own trails in order that I too might be able to experience this scripture differently. If you have the opportunity, I invite you to take a turn on perhaps one of your favorite trails and to rediscover this text. To imagine yourself walking with the burdens of your thoughts and your concerns and where you are right now, and then to imagine Jesus joining you on that walk, joining you right where you are, speaking to you the words that you need to hear, the comfort, the affirmation, the uplift that you need at this point in your life. What I enjoy about the passage of the walk to Emmaus is that those disciples thought that they were alone. They thought that they had been abandoned. They thought that God had forsaken them. And when God manifested in Jesus, that wise, mysterious stranger, then they realized that God was always with them. That the fullness of God was right there with them on that journey. So as you continue on your own personal journey, please trust that you do not walk alone. God is with you, and wherever your path leads you, may you be blessed, restored, renewed. Amen. Let us pray. Companion God, we thank you for being with us on this journey. These past few weeks, there have been times when our eyes have been kept from recognizing you. We've been annoyed with our own routines, perhaps finding it difficult to even make sense of our days. You encounter us in our lost place, in our confusion. You speak to us the words that we need to hear. You take as much time as is needed for us to be able to see you, to recognize you. But the entire time, our hearts were burning within us for we had misunderstood what was taking place. And you made clarity. We ask that you be with those right now who are continuing to serve at the front lines of this crisis. Every individual who is seeing that the health and the well-being of our communities is being tended to. Those who are making sure that the resources, the food, the supplies are on the shelves. So many difficult decisions that have to be made, we find ourselves as part of that process as well, weighing each decision to venture out asking ourselves, what do I need to do to make sure that I do not add to the burden? In all things, we give you thanks because we know that you have always been with us. You always will be with us. Thank you for providing us with what we need. And we ask you to remember us as we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now may the grace of God, the love of Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. May it keep you and guide you in peace. Amen.